Mari, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. I've been a fan of yours for years and was always like screenshotting your work, sometimes have posted and tagged your work. And here we are getting to connect. So that's really fun. Um, so there's so many cool things happening in your life right now. And even if I hadn't done the research about you for the podcast, I had already kind of like seen a few really cool glimpses of things that are happening. But before we get there, because we will, I think my audience would want to know a little bit about your journey of like, how the heck did this like sprightly, wide-eyed, deep girl get to do something she loves doing full time. What was that journey like of getting to do this work? How the heck did this happen? How did you build this platform? What were you doing before that? Oh man, the journey of like how this total dream existence came into reality. It's still like so surreal and so grateful for it, obviously. Um, Yeah, I... I had a long road. It was a long road uh, to get here. I've done a lot of other things in my life. Um, I was one of those people, I think there's so many of us running around who feel like we have so much passion and enthusiasm, but don't really know where to place that. Totally. Yeah. (laughs) Like all throughout my twenties, I thought, I know I could be really passionate about something, I just can't figure out what it is. And so I tried a lot of different jobs, Um, most recently marketing. That was my last um, office job before I um, became a writer full time. Although no, I have another job. So it's just a a continuous uh, unfolding. Um, And I'm interested in trying a lot of careers in my life. It doesn't stop here by any means. But um, before I became a full time freelance writer. Um, I had various office jobs at nonprofits. I was always really, you know, an idealist and always felt really passionate about a number of social issues as I still do and um, wanted to work in those fields, you know, putting all this enthusiasm to work, but I just couldn't really figure out what my place was. I felt like there were all these things I was so interested in, um, but the through line through all of it was writing. And um, I had known that I was naturally a writer. I always kept journals. I wrote a lot of letters. I was always writing in some way or another, writing the really long emails. Um, But it didn't occur to me that I could be a writer because the way I had seen it done was not the way that I knew how to write. The people my age who were getting famous and popular and these platforms um, and various websites, I didn't know how to write like they did. And at 28 years old, I already felt too old (laughs) to start. Um, So I started this Instagram account um, during a really, really rough period where I was spending a lot of time by myself and just trying to kind of get back to who I was. Um, during a period of grief and depression. And one way I did that was these drawings. And um, they were a new way to express myself. I'd never really drawn before in earnest. And um, I just decided to do it every day, really consistently. And I think that's, that was probably, um, you know, the the thing. I I think I I ran into a lot of luck during this time. One that was, um, uh, illustration was, becoming a really popular um, tool on Instagram. People were paying attention to illustrators. Um, Another was that this sort of more honest work was becoming, was getting, you know, in the zeitgeist. And I just happened to come along at a time when those were um, really well received. That certainly wasn't the case for a lot of my 20s. and then I built this platform through through my illustrations, which um, I got to write a bit in them as well. They're um, pretty text heavy. So that was a wonderful means of expression and then got a book deal and was able to uh, quit my job and go full time freelance. And it's been a really, really beautiful, really rich, really interesting ride. Isn't it incredible that we live in a time where a person can speak from their heart, make what they want to make, 
and find the people who receive that message without like working for the quote unquote man. Like you didn't have to like go into a building and like have someone give you permission. You didn't have to have yeah. a PhD. You didn't need a yeah. publisher. You could just like, and then you said very humbly, and then I had a lot of luck and look, there is a lot of synchronicity that we can't deny that kind of comes in and out of our life. But to me, the big deal here, the big bang here that like created the whole thing was the courage to just be seen and put it in the world. And I, that's how I found you is because like you said, you were being very real and talking about real things. What was your reaction? Were you pleasantly surprised or were you like, yeah, this is what I thought would happen. I would meet a world of supportive, kind humans. Cause I imagine that your Instagram following does feel that way, supportive and kind. Mm -hmm. They tend to be a pretty, pretty nice little crowd. <laughs> um, I'm still getting over the surprise. I mean, everything about it is surprising. I didn't really uh, feel like I fit in most of my life. I've always felt like a bit of an outsider. I always felt like my experiences were really, really specific to me and completely unrelatable to others. Um, the illustration project was a total experiment. It was for fun. It was to get to know myself better. It was to get to know a new way of expression. Um, and so to have people really resonate with that has been nothing but a really pleasant, wonderful surprise. I want to talk a little bit about the content and I'm actually just pulling up your account right now because I follow you and I love it. <laughs> but so that people can get a sense if they're by the end of this, I'm sure they're following you and there's already like literally a million people who follow you, but so that people can get a sense, talk to me about what the content is like so that they get it. And what, if you could remember, what was one of the first posts that did really well when you were like, oh, me speaking this open hearted actually lands? Because I want people to get that we get to be vulnerable, that we get to be honest. So explain a little bit about what that content is like. What were you saying? What are you saying, especially in the beginning? And I know it's grown. And can you remember, can you recall something you were like almost afraid to hit publish on, but that's something that did really well, that really struck a chord? Sure, yeah, it's it's grown a lot. I mean, it's I've evolved a lot, I should say. Um, and the way that I used to draw and illustrate on Instagram has changed um, a lot. And I really appreciate the people who are still around. I think, you know, the reasons why a lot of people came in the first place may not totally fit anymore. Um, I used to do a lot of sort of cartoons, um, especially about dating and my adventures being a late 20s single person. And now I'm a mid 30s um, single person with, <laughs> with, a, with a kind of a different set of interests. Um, and at first, yeah, I remember, I mean, everything I wanted to be in this kind of cartoon form. I remember the first uh, post that um, did really well by my standards. I think it got a hundred likes and I was like, oh my God, it went viral, <laughs> was, um, a drawing of my recent Google searches. And it was things like, um, I don't even remember, like, you know, how to do taxes or like, um, will I die if I eat expired takeout, stuff like that. And um, <laughs> I, I remember that that was my first one where I thought, oh my gosh, people are like, people are here for me. And it was so exciting. And I think from then on, I just, um, I kept pushing myself to go a little deeper, a little deeper. So when I was still kind of doing the cartoons, but maybe going a little, a little more emotionally deep, um, there was one where I had just gotten rejected by this guy I really liked. 
And I was so sure about him and I was so surprised and shocked by this rejection. And um, I wrote a pie chart about um, so single cute. life and uh, most of it's really great. And there was this like one sliver that was really sad and that's how I felt. And, um, and I remember thinking like, no one's going to get this except me. And that one did really well. And, and it just, it, it was so beautiful because it made me feel less alone. It's like, I'm putting this out there and people are saying, this makes me feel less alone, but it, it was really quite, <laughs> quite self, um, self-satisfying because it really made me feel less alone to hear that. And then ever since I've just, um, I've just, kept trying to pull back the layers a little more and be a little less specific about the um, the particulars and more specific about my actual emotions and feelings. And I always find that the more specific I am, the more people resonate because we're all basically going through the same things, which surprises me again and again, really beautifully. It's so amazing. It's just so amazing. There's so much here. One thing is I was talking, I had a the McGee's on here last week. Do you know them? Shay and Sid mm-hmm. McGee, they're so cute. And we were talking about how like initially she wanted a show on HGTV and they said no. And then she and her husband were like, how about we'll be so good they can't ignore us. We'll just build our own thing, <laughs> right? Like you just go to YouTube, start shooting yeah. your own stuff. And um, I recently had a conversation with the people who are running the Magnolia Network. And they were saying, we want, we don't want famous faces. We want real people. It's almost like you literally are the epitome of what objectively really across the board now is like considered the gold standard. It's like to find a person who on their own just started doing their thing, wasn't waiting to be given the permission, just started doing it and built something and here's the other piece of what you built. You, you, she said before very humbly, like she got a hundred likes. Now, just for people who don't know, she gets like 50,000 likes. You didn't just build a following. You build such depth in the kind of relationship you have with your following that it's so, it's not just impressive. It's, it's literally what's helping us as a society to get through is like finding other people. You said, I felt so alone at the time. And then I could just like go on there. Right. And look, then you didn't feel alone. And the people who followed you didn't feel alone for a moment when they could connect with your work. What do you think it takes to build that kind of depth and engagement? Oh, like just with other people in general? With your following. Like it, to me, it's not, a, it was never, for you, it's not like a vanity metric. It's not like mm-hmm. a race to how many. Mm-hmm. It was more about who's here and mm-hmm. let's be together, which is what makes it like lightning. <laughs> so what are people missing if they're trying to like have a big audience And what can we learn from you about creating a quality of a relationship? Because you've done it so well. I think a a lot about the different metrics of success and they're really different for every person. If someone wants a really big following, more power to them. That is a perfectly fine thing to want. That is not what drove me. And I think that you know, it was definitely for the best because that's really so out of your control. Um, something that I always try to keep in mind is that all I've ever wanted was to connect with people through my writing. That's all I've ever wanted to do. So if I have five followers and they read what I have to say, that's five people who are connecting with me, you know, from maybe a different state or a different country. That's beautiful. I'm very, very happy with that. And so if my goal remains to have people look at my writing and say, okay, that, that evokes something in me that even, even like the trolls and stuff, I always think, oh, it evoked something in them. It like made, it provoked them to say something, you know, like that's, that's kind of interesting. 
But if people feel resonance, if five people feel resonance, to me, that's like such a great success. So it's, it really has never been about the number for me. And again, that's fine if it is. I think it's so good to clarify what matters to you. And I think I spent 30 years clarifying what mattered to me. And so when I finally did reach that metric of success, which was being able to share my work um, in this way that felt really authentic and really good to me. I didn't have to change it for anyone. I wasn't going through, you know, a magazine where I had to write in a specific way. I could just write whatever I wanted. To me, that was like the greatest success. I've already had that, you know, that's beautiful. And um, anything else really is um, icing on the cake. And at this point, you know, numbers fluctuate all the time. I've lost a, a lot of followers since I, since my style has changed. So I'm, you know, you can't be too attached to that. You can't be too attached to things that you have no control over, or you're going to be pretty unhappy, but you can, you know, if you find the thing that you do have control over, which is your own self-worth, the things that gratify you, the things that you like to do every day, um, you know, the life that you love, the community that you have, that's what actually is sustainably happy for, for a person. Let me ask you this question, which is a tough one. I feel like for artists, especially, and I mean, all kinds of artists, whether you draw or you sing or you paint or anything. So I've learned through the course of time that at the core, somewhere along the way, what makes relationships successful is like radical empathy. And yet as an artist, I think there's a feeling of like, I don't want to sell out. I don't want to think too much about what my audience needs or is wanting. I want to think from a place of inspiration, but when somebody is successful, something has happened where they're not only finding something that feels sustainable and authentic, but they've definitely been able to figure out that something they're doing is needed. And they are listening. There's usually a point at which they're listening from a place of goodness, not from a place of selling out. And my mentor um, is Seth Godin, right? So he's like a person I go to for a lot of advice. Mm -hmm. He's been on the show three times and he would yeah, say business, business is radical empathy. That's, I got that from him, right? Mm -hmm. But artists struggle with this. Like, will I lose myself? if I start to ask my audience how they're feeling or notice what they're going through or write things to their pain points, hmm. how do you balance it? And what's your advice for people who don't just want to have a hobby? They would like to be able to be an artist full time. So therefore, how do we find a way to make something that people like and need and yet feel good about what we're making? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you mean like empathy enough to understand what people want so that we can sustain ourselves? Is that <laughs> I mean, you answer however you want, like that in of itself is an answer. Like, I guess what you're saying is if I heard you correctly, your, your first response was to the extent that I need to sustain myself, I need to have, I carve out some bandwidth to make things for an audience. Is that mm. what you just said? I'm, I'm wondering well, how you've done it because you seem so authentic <laughs> and at the same time you make a living mm -hmm. and there's humans who consistently show up. So it, mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that there is a part of you that wants to throw them a bone, that wants to care what they feel, that wants to make mm -hmm. things that, that soothe them. And you even said, I wanted my work to connect with other people. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just about like, I don't care if people come or go. There was a need to connect and it's worked and yet you've remained authentic. How much of the time are you thinking about what people's feelings are, what people are going through, what the collective is going through, or how often are you like, I'm just going to live for my own inspiration point. Hmm. I think almost everything I make is within community or within the collective. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm hyper aware of what, um, my particular 
audience is saying. I think that, you know, it's, it's kind of a microcosm of, of the, the bigger community. And um, I spend very, very little time on social media. So I, I tend not to know what exactly people are saying about my um, work. It's, it's really none of my business. And I really try to not look at it too much because it affects me, it can affect me in um, ways that make me a little too self-conscious to create authentically. But I am aware of what's going on in the greater community. I've always been really interested in, you know, what's kind of the big uh, cultural conversation right now. I've always been really interested in pop culture and um, what people are talking about, you know, and what are the what are the sort of trending topics um, in real time and online and all of that. And what I try to do is work within that. And I I say, okay, everyone seems to be talking about this thing right now, what's, what's a different perspective? What's a different way we could talk about this? Um, one of my most like viral illustrations is this post about Mother's Day, um, which is, um, it says thinking about, thinking of you, I think, and it's six different bouquets for people who might feel pain on Mother's Day for various reasons. And I wrote that because I saw a billion posts about Mother's Day and they were all, um, either new mothers or people thanking their mothers. And I thought, who's not being heard? Who's not being listened to here? And so I wrote something for the people who I thought were not feeling seen. So I like to kind of do a bit of rebellion against you know, what the bigger conversation is saying and say, well, who, who might not feel this way? Or what else can we say about this? And that's actually a big inspiration for me is kind of going against things that I don't like. Um, this book that I, I just wrote, My Inner Sky, is kind of a rebellion against positive thinking. I felt like that was getting us nowhere. And I wanted to write something that was sort of anti-positive thinking and more present thinking. Um, so I am, you know, aware of what's going on. As far as the like selling out question or the, um, or how to be, you know, how to connect with your audience while still remaining really true to yourself. I think the more, <laughs> the more you can like go inside yourself, the more you will be able to understand how other people work. I mean, we're all so similar and to really dig into your own human experience is to dig into other people's human experience. And you're, you're never going to speak for everyone. Oh my goodness. That's like one thing that I, I really want to drive home um, about social media that every post doesn't, you know, apply to every single person nor should it. But I think the more you go inside, the more you know yourself and the more introspective you can be, um, the more you will really understand what, what resonates with other people. And that can help you, um, you know, in the, in the business side of things, that's something that I, you know, I'm really conflicted about and I try to keep very separate from, from what I do on Instagram and how I kind of express myself naturally, but, um, but it's certainly, you know, it's part of it. This is so good. I just <laughs> love so much what you said, and we're going, we're going to talk about, am I there yet? But I want to talk about the new book because it's here today. It just came out and then mm -hmm. we can go back. Cause I do want to touch on it. Cause there's so many exciting things happening from that book right now. So I definitely want to mention it, but because you just said what you did before about how it's not getting us as far as we want to go to have all this positive thinking, I want to acknowledge this book, which is just so exquisite. My inner sky, um, Let's talk about that. I've recently um, been saying to my, my audience that in my own meditation practice, I really love this idea of just like putting out the welcome mat, mm. just like whatever's here. Yeah. And just without this, like um, pushing the river without this, like, so the job today is to feel good. It's, it's almost mm -hmm. like that in of itself creates some resistance and anxiety. And you're such a delight because you offer people just this safe space to fall apart. And when we're allowed to just acknowledge and like sit and witness what's going on, oftentimes that goes a really long way. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about why you wanted the collection of essays in this book to land the way you just said, why do you want us to make space for the pain? And what do you hope people will get from it? 
I want us to make space for the pain because pain exists. And to splinter yourself off from that is to completely disembody yourself. Um, something that has come to mind a lot in, in the past year, something I've been thinking about is um, your body is the only thing you will ever truly own. And it's the only permanent home you'll ever have. And there are so many messages that say that certain things don't belong in our body and your, your heart and your brain are also in your body. So I'm speaking to thoughts and emotions as well. And, and very often in the past year, I've heard all kinds of um, messages about how we should feel and um, how, what, you know, what grief looks like, what loss looks like. And I found myself feeling certain emotions that um, society would tell me don't belong in, in my brain, in my body. And I'm still experiencing them. So they must because I own my body. And, <laughs> and so there's got to be space for them. I feel the way I feel. Humans are capable of 34,000 distinct emotions. And hopefully we feel all of them in our life. That's kind of the goal to me. Um, and we get all kinds of messages about how certain feelings don't belong. I've heard uh, very often when, um, when people feel down or they feel a sense of loss about things that might not be that big in the grand scheme, um, the antidote is be grateful. And I always think that is the funniest thing to say because gratitude doesn't mean you're happy. <laughs> You can be very, you can be in a lot of pain and be grateful for the pain. You can be in, you can really miss something and be so grateful that you miss it. And, um, you know, gratitude is a friend of grief. It's not the opposite. And I don't believe there are any opposite emotions. You can be sad and happy at the exact same time. And um, I just really wanted this book to be like a home for every emotion that we go through and let everyone feel welcome. It's so, it's so important what you're saying. And I've just been reading Janine Roth's book, Women, Food, and God. Mm -hmm. Have you read this book? No. Is it fabulous? <laughs> It's amazing. I think it's the best book I've ever read so far. Oh my gosh. Well, I I, I'm like, un, yeah, I'm underlining every single line. And basically she's saying in this book, what you're saying, and then her own perspective on what you're saying, which is when we actually turn toward the sadness, the loneliness, the grief, the anxiety, we, we are liberated because we we find that we actually can, we can hold those feelings and they do not annihilate us. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. won't destroy us. Right. It's actually the opposite that like, right. Go toward the pain and the sorrow and the grief and the whatever you want to put in that. And then there's something beyond that, that's holding that feeling. And what I'm noticing in my own journey is it's a feeling of being integrated. Yes. So it's like, oh, even though this hurts right now and I'm so present with whatever this is, I love this feeling of being awake because I'm meeting myself beyond this person who constantly wants to escape from these feelings. Yeah. You're right. That's so disembodied. It's such yeah. an awful feeling of constantly yeah. having to leave yourself to not feel what you feel, good luck. Like you can watch all the <laughs> Netflix you want, scroll your phone as long as you want. Yes, yes. And we're so not taught that. We're not taught to just sit with it. And as I'm sure you found, once you sit long enough, it's like this quote who I don't know who said it. It might it was have just me. Been, it was for sure uh, me. <laughs> it was definitely you. <laughs> Might have been just like a friend of mine in a text. Um, yep. Um, I think it's, we can see in the dark if we wait long enough. Something to that effect. Oh, and, so good. Um, so good. And so I think a lot about, yeah, like when the lights first turn off, you're like, what? I can't see anything. It's really disorienting. But if you get adjusted to it, you find that you can see things in a totally different way. And you're actually you're kind of built for that. Like you're, if you sit there, 
you will find things in it. Um, right now I'm working as a hospital chaplain and the thing, the like <laughs> number one thing that I have to do in my work is just sit in loss and grief, like not offer hope necessarily, not offer a solution, not offer a quote or a book, but just sit with it, just be present. And when I'm first with someone who's having a really hard time, maybe one of the hardest things they've ever been through, it's really uncomfortable and it makes me want to say, oh, things will be better. Or, um, oh, when I went through this, you know, look at me now or whatever. Like I want to give something because it's so like itchy and uncomfortable to sit there. But as soon as you move through that and it takes a while, but when you move through that and sit there, you find that you're kind of like in real time transforming and there is a beauty to be found there that can only be found mm -hmm. in that pain. And not to like, you know, glorify pain, but um, I just wish it was something that we accepted a bit more. Yeah. And it's so big because so often in our work and in our life, we, we think, you know, we have to, like Mary Oliver says, like walk on our knees for a thousand miles. Like there's so much to do and there's so much to, produce and so often what people are so desperate for is someone who just like sits beside them yeah. to just witness it yeah and like make the space and just hold that and it is so uncomfortable but then the longer you do it you realize like you just said so be we're, we're built to do that like we can be with it and it doesn't make it feel sweet or amazing, but there's something satisfying. <clears throat> there's a satisfaction in that feeling of just being awake to it. It's, um, it beats the story we tell ourselves or the running away, even yes. though it's, um, it's painful. Yeah. It's kind of like that feeling when you're at a funeral and something crosses your mind where you're like, why do I feel good right now? Oh, you feel good because everyone around you in this moment, including yourself is present and mm. you're sad, but you're being with your sadness. And there's something about that. It's not, I don't know if I could say good. It's like, there's an equanimity. There's something that goes, whoa, like this is like, so awake and so present that the present being present actually feels awesome because we're so rarely present. Well, it's like peak human, right? It's like right. humans are um, extremely emotionally attuned animals with a huge capacity for a range of emotions. And to be like, really sad is to be so human <laughs> and um that I did it guys <laughs> I'm doing it I'm a human I right? won <laughs> I'm at how my human peak. can you be I'm at my peak <laughs> exactly I mean there's something like um so valuable in that I I think there's a value to anything that we struggle through that's why people climb mountains and do marathons it's not like fun. I mean, maybe it is to some people, but, um, or to, you know, to work on something that took so much out of you and was so exhausting. Right. right. Um, but there's, there's value to that. Yeah. And yep. it's like, okay, this is a treasured experience as much as something really joyful. Yeah. It's beautiful. I love what you're saying. It's very, talk about, <laughs> like you said, rebelling against the sort of the universal messaging. Yeah, I'm with you. I think positive thinking is uh, exhausting. Um, <laughs> but I'm also really curious about the neuroscience that shows the sort of memorized neural pathways and the ways in which our body kind of chemically gets addicted to the different chemicals get, that get released from negative thoughts. And I'm really interested in like learning about that and holding it and then seeing if I can try to actually find my way to potentially a thought that's beyond this addiction of the past, because there really is science that shows that. And it's, 
it's amazing. It is amazing how we wake up wired, physically addicted in the body. Forget the mind. The body is physically addicted to a certain um, set of thoughts that lead to a certain set of chemicals. And that's amazing to me. So I've been mm. doing, I've been doing a lot of work looking at that, feeling into that. And then when you tell your body to cross that river into something more expansive, expansive, your body is scared of that. It's more comfortable sitting a little bit in the darker stuff because it's probably literally addicted to it. Hmm. So that's also really interesting. And then holding both of those things, right? Mm -hmm. Being present and mindful while also seeing if we can, if we can, if we can make space to live this day a different way than we did mm. yesterday. If there is a p potential for a more expans expansive feeling, like, I don't know what that could be. It could be exhilaration. It could be joy. It could be excitement. It's just you really speak fascinating. in my language. I love, <laughs> I've, got, I've gotten really into neuroscience, haven't we all <laughs> lately? So this is so fascinating. I just spent a week with Joe Dispenza and Marco Island. Oh. What so a I'm just, dream. Yeah. And they, even this morning I'm meditating using a heart math. Um, you're, I'm linked up so I can actually see when oh I drop gosh. into coherence. Well, like we all need one of these. Oh my gosh. <laughs> totally. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you're the best. That's clear. Um, <laughs> we've had almost 400 guests on the show. You're like probably the smartest person. So um, let's also, cause it's just so fantastic. Can we talk about your other book and how this book is now just you know it's just becoming a show that's all just just a just a tv show that's all let's talk about that book and how do you feel about this amazon series like how is this this is incredible thank you you know it's it's really funny um i uh, i have always been a, a little allergic to the phrase that's so exciting um, cause I always, cause it usually follows when, when you've like worked either really hard on something or there's a, something's about to happen that will require a lot of work. So for instance, when I like moved into an apartment that I, that I really wanted to move to and people said, that's so exciting. And I thought, well, it's going to be a lot of work and like money, you know, I, I don't know if it's just like exciting. Exciting is something that just happens to you that requires no work or like my book coming, coming out is sure. It's exciting, but it's also like super raw and vulnerable and intense and, and a lot of work. So I, I don't know if I would say it's like exciting. I think like a birthday is exciting because it just happens to you. You right. don't even you can be passionate for it. about it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I will say I do have a point with this what with what I'm saying. Um, the show is exciting because I kind of did nothing <laughs> to make it happen. Um, the book I did write, but all of this TV stuff has just been like it's a foreign language to me. I never really know what's going on. Um, it was something that um, has been in the works for a couple years now, um, but I didn't really do anything to make it happen. It just happened. And so it is really exciting because I don't really know much about it. And um, it's just been this like dessert of a life experience. Um, I'm not writing for it. So I'm just kind of sitting back and watching it play out. And I really trust the writer. She's absolutely uh, just so, so brilliant. Who is and she? Her name's Camilla Blackett. Um, she's done a lot of really good writing. She's a really um, nuanced, thoughtful, insightful, cool person who I want to be more like. Um, so it's really such an honor to have her working on it. She's put her totally own spin on it. Um, so what yeah, happened? Cool. You were just, you were going along in your life. The book is out. People loved it. And then mm -hmm. somebody sent you a DM saying, can we turn this into a show? <laughs> Basically. Yeah. I can't even remember at this point how exactly this was like three years ago. It's TV shows take a long time is something that I've learned from the industry, but um, yeah. And I just, you know, I sat in on meetings, but um, it was just such a, a wonder fun. to watch. Yeah, totally. It's like this industry I know nothing about. So it's well, been cool. 
it makes so much sense that it's going to be a show because for anyone who doesn't know the book, this is what the book is called. Am I there yet? The loop de loop zigzagging journey to adulthood. That is what every show should be. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So let's just talk about that for a moment. Um, What was it that you most wanted to say in that collection of, of thoughts in that book? Oh man, that was a really special project for me. I, um, it came out, I think when I was 30, but I got the book deal when I was 28 and I wrote the first essay when I was 24. So it felt like oh, this um, wow. really sweet kind of real time mm-hmm. um, journal almost that I was so, so grateful to get to share. Um, and what I really wanted was for people to know it was so, so okay to not know what you wanted to be or do, but I wanted to um, empower people to really get to know themselves. That's kind of like my, my umbrella mission in life is getting to know yourself is the most important thing we can do. It's the most beautiful journey. Um, And so to know, you know, all of the little corners of yourself, know, know what matters to you and Um, know what's important to you, um, live with a gratitude for what you've built in your life, what you've cultivated in your life, as opposed to, you know, these external things, which are so prized in our society, you know, job and um, boyfriend and whatever, um, to have to have a real knowledge of yourself and your values is, is just such a richer experience. And that's what I wanted to share through all these little cartoons, mostly about dating and uh, job fiascos. I feel like you're everyone's instant best friend. Ah, like I'm sitting here and I'm like, I'm good. I'll just talk to her for the rest of my life. (laughs) Let's have a seven hour podcast. (laughs) She's so awesome. You're so cool. Um, So speaking of what you just said, it's interesting because we're we're coming up on 20 million downloads. I started this show four years ago. Wow. And Congratulations. I thought, thank you. I thought that this show was all about helping people find their life's work because that was that was what I did, right? I was a songwriter for 10 years, having a mom who was like super depressed my whole life for having not explored her dreams. Yeah. And so I started the show with like, oh, I'll have all of these successful creatives on and we'll talk about how you build a business. And what I came to find out is people had no idea who they were. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that the reason that they tuned in was that they were hoping that just maybe every time they listened, they'd walk away with a clue of what they actually Ooh. like, or maybe oh, what they actually that. are meant to do. And it hurts. It, it actually, I can feel that pain when mm-hmm. people are listening right now and they're like, I know that there's something about mm-hmm. me that makes mm-hmm. me me. Mm-hmm. And there's this big feeling of emptiness. And so you've gone on, you illustrated this workbook, getting their workbook for growing up. And you also have the Skillshare class drawing as self-discovery, five ways to start. And all of your work really, like you said, is in some way a guidepost to feel what you feel, to know what you know, to come back home to yourself. What do you say to people about it? How can we get in on this thing that you've been doing, which is getting to know ourselves? How can we start down that journey? How do we get a clue or four clues about Mm -hmm. who we are? How do we begin that? And how can we excavate all the yummy stuff or even the not so yummy stuff? Yeah. Oh yeah. All, all this stuff. Um, <laughs> you know, I really had an advantage, uh, in my life. I had a great privilege, which was, I didn't fit in my entire childhood and adolescence. I really did not have any friend who I really connected with. I, I didn't just didn't really have friends. And um, as an only child, I spent a lot of time just with my mom. I didn't feel like I understood kids, but I also like obviously couldn't hang with adults. So I felt like, all right, I'm just going to 
be by myself, I guess. Um, so I got to know myself really well at a young age. And in a lot of ways, I, I feel like I kind of had a reverse adulthood experience. I, I think when I was young, I was um, learning a lot of things that people, that I, I found that people tend to just be thinking about now in their, their 30s and 40s. But I wasn't doing the things like dating or having friends or going to parties. That I learned, I had to learn how to do later. Um, so I had this kind of flipped experience and that was such a privilege because I got to know myself young and I kind of thought everyone did. And then I realized, oh no, okay. Most people like were spending time <laughs> doing other things, going to parties, hanging out at the mall or whatever. While I was like in my room alone, journaling about all of my feelings. And so that to me was such a great privilege. And the, the thing I can say to, to replicate that experience or to kind of start digging in there, um, if you were someone who was more popular when you were younger, <laughs> is um, put yourself in the experience of being an outsider. Um, whatever that looks like to you, you know, take yourself, put yourself somewhere where you're going to be the worst one in the room, you know, take a dance class that you know you'll be terrible at, go on a trip by yourself where you know you're going to be a little lonely, put yourself in experiences where you're going to have to be alone. And some of them are more pleasant than others. You can journal at a cafe, totally fine. Um, but I think the best thing you can do to start like really getting to know yourself is kind of like push on those, those, you know, those walls that you're not quite sure about. Don't always seek to fit in, seek to stand out a bit because that's how you're going to learn. And it actually, a lot of it is a really pleasant experience. Traveling by yourself, I think is, is one of the most delightful experiences. I just love it. And as somebody who is such a codependent, um, always <laughs> been such a people pleaser, wanted so much for everybody to always be okay. So I, whatever, we all have our things. So, um, I would just learn to abandon myself just over and over yeah. again, over and over yeah. again. And so hearing you talk about this time to just like, and here I was not being popular, but being around a lot of humans yeah. who I would just like figure out how to yeah. please. So yeah. 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 And um, speaking of that last question or so is I think for my audience, something that really comes up a lot is this unworthiness. Oh my mm -hmm. God. And mm -hmm. so how could I post something? It's not good enough. What are mm -hmm. people going to think? So you've been very brave and very honest and posted lots of things and written things. And we just talked about it. So what would you say to someone who feels like, you know, they're not worthy of posting or they're so worried that it won't be good enough or it'll be messy or nobody will like it or they won't fit in? What's oh, your perspective on that? I'm so sorry to that that feeling I mean one thing to to know is that everybody feels that way and we feel it throughout every human feels that throughout the day no matter how yeah, successful they seem no matter what they have that comes up in so many different ways I mean if I I can't even tell you the number of times throughout a day I feel jealous. I feel insecure. I feel like nobody likes me. I feel like my work doesn't matter all day, every day it's happening. Yep, I can relate. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, it's, it's, I mean, that is one of those feelings that's so hard to integrate and embrace because it feels like, oh, why am I feeling this way? And other people don't feel this way, but they do. I Trust me, I know a lot of people who are successful, creative people, and they all feel this way. Um, I think something that can be so helpful is to take a real beat and think, why do I want to do this? What am I... What, where's the joy in creating this? 
um, I started drawing because it's a really soothing physical activity to color watercolors in, you know, in, in like a, a Sharpie line. It's a really soothing activity. I wanted something to kind of take my mind off of whatever and, um, and just do this really relaxing thing. For me, that was the joy. And I always thought you cannot control the way that the world perceives you. Again, none of your business but you can control your experience of what you're doing. You can say, they can't take away how much fun I had doing this. They can't take away um, how delightful it is to sit and have my little cat nap next to me while I'm drawing. They can't take that away. I could get the worst review on planet earth and they can't take away how much I loved writing this book or you know whatever you do. And so think about those things that are for you only. And um, I think that helps so much with, you know, the sense of worthiness that the world can give and take, and it does give and take all the time. Um, that's so, so deeply out of your control, but the things that you can control are the things that happen inside, inside your home, which is your body. I love that. And I love the image of you sitting next to your cat is doing watercolor. The, the best. So, so relaxing. It really is. It really is. It's relaxing just to listen to. Um, Mari, thank you for all of this. And tell everybody where they can get your book and where they can follow you and keep, keep along with the journey. My new book is My Inner Sky, available wherever you buy books. Um, Instagram is by Mari Andrew. And this was so beautiful. Thank you for giving me space to explore all my feelings today. I'm, I'm so, so grateful. You're so easy to <laughs> hang out with. <laughs> Likewise.